Um, but, but you know, really, we should start with a survey. How many people use toilets here? <laughs> just just want to check. Okay, so this is part of the Gates Foundation uh, reinventing the toilet challenge. And, uh, and you know, I really appreciate that nice introduction. I, I like to say I still haven't decided what I want to do when I grow up because I do spend a lot of time in engineering management and then a lot of time in research. My research area is in material science, but I'm in the electrical and computer engineering department. So I have lots of different um, activities that come together in an engineering sense when you start talking about an engineering system. And a toilet is certainly an engineering system, a very complex engineering system, in fact, that takes a lot of infrastructure and uh, a lot of thought in how we design or reinvent such a complex system. I think the best way to start with this is a little clip that the Gates Foundation has put together about reinventing a toilet and why we need to do that. And uh, this will also uh, get us in the right frame of mind to start talking about things related to toilets. Because I understand you all are eating lunch. I apologize, <laughs> but uh, that's just the way this is, this is set up, so we're going to have to go with it. I will say that I'm, I'm rather uh, a squeamish uh, person in general. And when I first took on this project, the, the head PI uh, at RTI International a colleague I've worked with for many years, and he started, and we go out to dinner and lunch a lot, he started talking about the project over dinner and lunch in the beginning, and he could tell that I was not comfortable with that. It didn't take but a few weeks till now we can talk about poop and feces and urine and all kinds of things over meals. So, in fact, that's what's going to happen to you all today. <laughs> so let me go ahead and just play this uh, to one and a half minutes, so it won't be very long, but I think it's a great way to, uh, for us to get started. Poop. Doo-doo. Number two. Caca. Crap. Shit. There's a ton of it. And dozens of words to describe it. But for 2.6 billion people around the globe, there's no place to actually do it. Imagine that. No reliable sanitary toilet. What would you do? Well, what you have to do, use anything you can find. Which means in no time, you've got a big pile of problems. Like diseases. Deadly diseases that are filling half the hospital beds in developing countries. A serious, well, crappy scenario that by working in partnership, we can change. How? By doing something that hasn't been done for centuries. Reinventing the toilet. The flush toilet, as you and I know it, requires a massive amount of sewer infrastructure and immense amounts of water. Two things increasingly hard to come by. Now is the time to eliminate the health hazards, recycle waste, and turn crap into valuable resources like clean burning fuel, fertilizer, and believe it or not, fresh water. Today our toilets can't do that, but the toilet of tomorrow can. Reinventing the toilet. Let's get our shit together and do it. Okay, so that, that sets the stage, I think. Uh, let's just review a couple of things that, that were in that uh, clip, but that we want to uh, highlight. So 2.6 billion people are without proper sanitation or reliable sanitation. Disease caused by unsafe sanitation accounts for roughly half of all hospitalizations in the developing world, according to the United Nations. Every year, food and water that are tainted with fecal matter cause 2.5 billion cases of diarrhea and 1.5 million child deaths have a diarrheal contribution. So the solution, and it's not as they said in that clip, the solution is to reinvent the toilet. Now, what we have to understand is historically the, the invention of the toilet did exactly for developing worlds or developed worlds what we're trying now to do for developing worlds. So it removes pathogens from the human waste and recovers valuable resources. We want energy, clean water, etc. Um, we want to do it off the grid now because the infrastructure that's required of our classic or traditional toilets is simply not feasible in most places in the world. We need to do it at a cost of less than five cents per user per day. And that puts a lot of constraint on the scaling of this. Um, scaling up would make it a lot cheaper, but there's a, a strong desire socially to not have a scale up public toilet, but to have a single family or single community toilet. And it can promote financially uh, a lot more stability and sanitation and business opportunities in these developing regions. And if that's not enough, 
it's actually financially very valuable. Um, improved sanitation is expected to produce $9 for every dollar invested through increased productivity, decreased health costs, etc. That's a huge return if we believe it and if we can convince investment investors to in fact believe that figure. So let's look at a couple situations. Um, what we're really trying to stop here and the Gates Foundation with this initiative, so Reinvent the Toilet Initiative, is open defecation. And this is happening in many places in the world and has become <coughs> what is not just socially acceptable, but in fact socially preferable. So they're trying to change that mindset, but they need another technological solution. At the same time, they develop the social, financial, <coughs> etc. frameworks for the solution. And these are just some pictures that show many times the, the waste is finding its way many times directly into water sources and those water sources then are used for cleaning and also have a strong connection with food chains. Now if you can see here, this is, this is what's referred to by one of the uh, Gates Foundation executives as a nice toilet. So really all this is is a, a plank out over a canal and that's, that's what's considered sort of uh, a higher end toilet in many of these regions. But again, directly into a water supply. So food sources, uh, not just uh, seafood like fish, etc., but food sources are very closely related to these water sources. Watering fields, watering uh, trees, plants, agriculture of all types, in addition to utilizing the, the water for food sources and water and water cleaning and, and water drinking is a huge problem. Obviously, that's where the link and why the statistics are so. Uh, scary from the perspective of how the sanitation impacts health. So we're part of a, a very large effort at the Gates Foundation. We're a small part of a very large effort and we've just started this in September. So it was great to have the invitation so early in the program because I, I think we'll develop linkages with lots of different people here at Duke and elsewhere uh, through as, we, as this program progresses. So this is really kind of um, within the first quarter of what we've been working on so far and there's a lot of uh, potential to modify and, and develop collaborations as we go along. So please feel free to talk to me afterwards if you have an interest and if you think there might be a good, a good way to connect. Um, so the lead PI is actually Brian Stoner, a fellow at the uh, Research Triangle Institute International out in the Research Triangle Park. For those of you who don't know, RTI is the second largest nonprofit research organization in the country behind Battelle and has a, a very large both social science arm and engineering sciences arm. He is in the engineering sciences and this project came out of his interest in developing cleaner water and sanitation practices related to, as a material scientist, related to his area of um, expertise and then grew into a, a truly a systematic or systems approach to reinventing the toilet and he's put together an incredible team that I'll talk about. Um, this is me, Jeff Glass, and this is a team that is in the uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering Department in the Engineering School here, as well as the Engineering Management Program. So let's talk, we've talked about the need and the foundation, the Gates Foundation identifying, it. for those of you who are, are not familiar with their, their programs, they're very strategic about everything they do. And this Reinvent the Toilet Challenge became a very strong program for us for them a couple of years ago. I think they announced it in um, 2011. And since then they've been bringing on different groups to develop these uh, reinvented toilets with the understanding that there's uh, a very healthy um, collaborative environment they're trying to develop where different groups are taking different approaches, but the ultimate approach may actually require multiple groups utilizing various uh, small parts of their um, the technology or their approach. So let's talk a little bit more about the team and the concept. So from RTI International, they're leading the program and they do a lot of the systems engineering and also have a very strong social science and economics perspective and help with guiding some Duke uh, students in that area as well. Um, we're focused on the liquid waste disinfection in uh, my group at Duke. And Colorado State University is focused on the solid waste combustion module for the program. And they have a long history of cook stoves there and have supplied a number of units we'll talk about in a few minutes. <coughs> a number of other uh, partners, um, Advanced Diamond Technologies 
is uh, develop the uh, fundamental platform for the liquid waste disinfection, and I'll show that in a few minutes, and uh, are continuing to help to improve and refine that uh, over time, along with some companies that have a, a strong interest and, and expertise in the whole system, in actually building the, this structure um, in, a, in a very um, cost-effective, environmentally friendly way. And then there are two advisors, the NASA and the Naval Research Labs. As you can imagine, NASA would be a great uh, partner because they have to send uh, astronauts up in space with uh, as little uh, technology weight and uh, most efficient use of uh, all of their systems. So they've been looking at reutilizing urine and how to treat waste uh, for, for many years and have helped uh, now actually advise the Gates Foundation in addition to our project. And then Naval Research Labs, similarly, you can imagine on, on ship, on boat, on submarines, uh, there's a limited space, limited um, efficient, limited power, so more efficiency is needed. And they're also advisors on this project and uh, adjunct faculty in our department. So at Colorado State University, the Center for Energy and Global Health, uh, Morgan DeFord, Jason Prappas, and John Mazia are uh, the key uh, players. And we have our very own Mark DeSus is here from uh, Civil Environmental Engineering. Um, Mark is actually running uh, programs in for the Gates Foundation as well, and we're really starting to link up now where uh, he's generously supplied the know-how for our disinfection um, metrics, et cetera. So we expect them that we'll continue to overlap and do some joint programs in the future. And in the engineering management program, so we call it the MEM program at, uh, in, at the engineering school, but actually it, officially at Duke it's the MEMP program because the Master of Environmental Management is the MEM program uh, originally. So in the engin engineering management has done a uh, really great job looking at um, social factors, financial factors, and uh, some costing for the program as part of a team project uh, last semester, and we'll continue that uh, this semester. So, what did we, what did we propose? And, and this is this is very much a um, work in progress. The Gates Foundation has a target of prototype of this system by December of this year. Um, it's interesting, you know, as an engineer, you really like to have applied projects and get things out in the field. But as scientists, we also like to look at the basic science behind many of these issues. And this project has a very nice combination of both, with a lot of good, what I would call good pressure to get the prototyping done, but with an understanding that we need the science uh, to, in order to understand if the prototype's going to be effective. And in fact, the Gates Foundation is also very supportive of the public publishing in this area, and, and partly why I understand they did the video that I showed in the beginning is they're trying to change the way we dialogue about this area. It is a bit taboo. We haven't, we aren't comfortable talking about these things openly in developed countries, and everything is already taken care of for us. But if we truly need to reinvent how we handle human feces, human urine, it's going to require a huge dialogue between the developed countries and the developing uh, countries. And there were some interesting social um, resistances that I'll talk about a little later in the presentation. But let's look at the uh, basic unit here that we propose. Um, the housing obviously here on top of solar panel. One of the key issues about this project, it has to be energy neutral. There's no way to bring in external energy to this from the grid, so it has to be energy neutral. One easy way to do that is a solar panel. Now our actual designs will, will enable this to run without a solar panel, but certainly for the first prototypes, it'll be important to have some safety factors in, so we, we put a solar panel in there. But we'll talk about some of the risks with that, with that kind of a design in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, in addition, then, there is a, a screw auger uh, configuration where we <coughs> separate the liquid and the solid waste and compress the solid waste so that we dry it to the proper consistency that it can actually burn. So combustion of waste is not a new phenomenon. Probably anyone who's worked in the developing uh, regions has seen that. Not human waste, typically. Um, but in this case, the human waste can be utilized as an energy source and uh, put energy back into the system if we combust it, and then the ash can actually be used on, in agriculture. And then below, there's a, a raw liquid uh, catch bin that then feeds through an electrochemical cell, and the treated liquid comes out and can be utilized as gray water uh, from this side of the, of the cell. I've covered everything, I think so. Oh, and we'll talk a little bit about this. There's also, in addition to the solar energy conversion, there's what we call thermoelectric energy conversion. And I'll, I'll cover that in a minute. 
it's key that this be modular. So if we find that you know, the combustion system works really well, the disinfection system that we put together is not, not efficient enough, not the best approach, then we want to be able to go out to other Gates funded projects and say, look, here's the project that we've been working on. We need to get rid of this part of the modular concept, but we think this is the best approach for the uh, treatment of the solid waste and collaborate with them. That's a key for the Gates Foundation. They're putting tens of millions of dollars into this program this year, and they want to make sure that we're leveraging uh, different uh, groups and different uh, folks. So this is just a side view of the same uh, unit. A um, couple of additional things is everything has to be designed efficiently. So to dr help the drying, in addition to the compression that this screw uh, compressor provides, we utilize sunlight to, to help with the drying, um, utilize solar radiation to help with the venting. Um, we also have in this region the solid waste combustion. I'll talk about a thermoelectric. And we're right now looking at a developing a gravity-fed cell rather than a pump cell, but at the moment we're working primarily with a pump cell. That also comes up with this uh, compressor is, can we have this compressor operate, or can we, uh, I'll make it more general, can we utilize combustion for the solid waste without actually having a motor? Because as you can imagine, the motor takes a lot of power, and being energy neutral with the motor is going to be tough, so I'll talk about, talk about that a little bit. Okay, so let's spend a few minutes on the biomass drying and combustion uh, as part of the technical description. So this is the group at uh, Colorado State University, and I, I've, we've had one of our, quarterly, our first quarterly program review out there. Uh, fantastic facility, uh, not, not a typical university facility. As it says here, they've already supplied 300,000 biomass combustion units worldwide. Uh, that's not something a university is very... Uh, how should I say, usually doing. So this is a really fantastic applied research lab that does both the modeling and the construction and the testing all at once and have uh, provided some really interesting uh, ways to look at this part of the system, this combustion region of the system, including the compression and the uh, drying. Um, so let me talk for a second about this thermoelectrically enhanced <coughs> combustion add-on. This was actually developed at RTI. And what this does is improves the efficiency and allows the robustness of the system to be increased. So when I say robustness, I mean you're, you're sitting out in the field and if you don't have exactly the right uh, content in terms of liquid to solid and you try to do this combustion and your combustion unit goes out or you know it's got a very narrow range of operation, you've got a problem. So the way that that's solved is a couple of different things we do, but one is having this unit, this thermoelectrically enhanced combustion unit that allows us to blow air onto the combustion region to ensure that we have a larger window of operation for that, that system and a more effective, more efficient combustion uh, process. Now thermoelectric, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's simply you take heat and you turn it into electricity with a solid state device. So you don't have a lot of moving parts, you just have a material that's a thermoelectric material. And that material then, by having a thermal gradient across, of it, across it, can then generate electricity. So those of you who might be thinking, well, that's just like a solar cell. That's right. It's, it's the thermal equivalent of a solar cell. So a solar cell, you, you shine light on it, it generates electricity. The, the thermoelectric, you heat it on one side, and it generates electricity. So that's a, a unit, an area that RTI has been an expert in for a number of years, and that unit has already been developed for other purposes um, at RTI and will be implemented in this. This is a... There we go. Uh, this is a, a picture of the unit as it's, as it's uh, devised for a cook stove, and that will be now transferred to this uh, combustion of the solid waste. And I think that's all I really need to say about that. Okay, so this is actually what we saw in our last quarterly program review. That's a really a beautiful flame from a small pile of feces in the bottom of that tube, and this is actually dog poop. So the all the researchers and their friends bring the feces in from their dogs, and they're utilizing it. And, and it turns out it's it's quite effective in two senses. One, it's it's not generally uh, as much liquid as you might have in a, in a problem feces, so that's good, they can get started on it. And it's uh, consistent, relatively consistent. So it's a good way to start. 
Now, ultimately, they're going to have to be able to handle all different variations, and that will include the drying system. But for now, this is a, a great proof of concept. Now, really, this flame, this is just for the picture. You don't really want a flame like that in a court, <laughs> as you can imagine, right? So it's nice to show us that they are burning, but we, we'd rather have just a little glow down there and <laughs> leave the flame uh, behind. And in fact, that's what uh, the, uh, the operation of this is, is in fact, that uh, does that as well. So there are things like, how do you ignite this? Obviously, you can't require that people are putting feces into the system consistently all day long, right? You have to be able to ignite it and start it and stop it as needed, leaving some sort of smoldering for, for some cases, but other cases where it's out for a long time, it might have to go completely out and you reignite. So that's a big part of the design. The densification of the feces, how dense is it when it goes in there, key to how quickly it burns and how hot it burns. Um, that porosity is included in that. The access to the ash. After this burns, there's a pile of ash to be taken care of. Well, if that pile of ash is hidden or is not easily taken out, it's going to cause problems. And in fact, in our work in looking at failures in the field in developing countries, that is exactly what we found. That simple maintenance, like removing ash from combustion units, has created failures in the field for multi-thousand dollar units that communities invested in. So it's a huge but simple problem to consider. Um, the sensitivity to moisture content is a big uh, part of this research. The uh, basic combustion energetics, just how well will it burn. You don't want it to smolder or smoke. When we saw this unit fired up, the first couple of minutes were a lot of smoke, a lot of smoldering. We don't really know why. The researchers don't know why yet. We haven't just started this. And of course, in a normal room, that would have been uh, causing a lot of odor and a big problem. It was in a hood, of course, so no big deal. Ironically, we're all standing beside it waiting for it to stink. I mean, we're burning poop after all, right? So we're standing there waiting for it to stink and it really never did. And so we're in our quarterly review meeting, we're taking a break, so we said, okay, well, let's, let's take a break. So a number of us went outside and man, did it stink outside. <laughs> so the hood was venting it to the outside. It turns out, not only was the hood venting it to the outside, but then it's, you know, easily spread all around the outside of the building. That's exactly one of the social factors I'll talk about later in terms of odor. Mark actually is uh, an expert in this area and is going to be contributing uh, to the, this area for the Gates Foundation and for our project. Um, but what we find is that the odor is not simply inside the unit or outside. It's complete. You have to be uh, concerned with it in both, both areas. And then uh, finally, the uh, range of effective airflow. So how much leeway do we have in terms of the stability of the combustion? And how much of this forced air do we have to provide via the thermoelectric unit? So let's talk a little bit about electrochemical disinfection. So we actually started with electrochemistry in areas like neural probes and um, energy storage devices like supercapacitors and batteries. So that's where our electrochemistry comes from. And we've been working in areas related to uh, diamond electrodes for many years. I'll talk for a minute about those. Um, but it turns out that it's an excellent way to disinfect as well. So uh, just a reminder, the electrochemistry, the electrochemical cell is down here between the raw liquid and the, and the treated liquid. And we hope to have a gravity feed, although as I mentioned right now, we're pumping through. Um, the key for this is actually the fecal content of the urine. I'm sure you all know much better than I, urine is actually, doesn't have any pathogens in it. Urine is actually sterile right out of the body. So the problem is when you have people urinating and defecating, they're going to mix, right, to some extent. I told you we were going to talk frankly about it, right? They're going to mix. And the, the how much they mix is will deter, mix will determine on the, dependent on the system, but also dependent on the condition of the people utilizing the, the system. So you have to be able to handle that in the disinfection of the urine. Now, in fact, it's, it's a very complex problem because you can imagine the pathogens are actually inside small nodules of fecal matter, which means that you're trying to electrochemically disinfect, but you first have to get to the pathogens. And the number of variations there is tremendous. It's, I mean, you can almost think of it as infinite. The number of pathogens, the size of the nodule, the shape of the nodule, so you have to have, again, a very robust process. So that will be, we just started mixing up the fecal matter, uh, the simulated fecal matter in urine. That will be a major part of the project going forward. I'll show you the initial results prior to bringing the fecal matter in because we have not started testing that yet. 
Um, the other thing that's important here is the energy budget. It's an electrochemical cell, which means that you have to supply a voltage and electricity, you know, electrical current to it, and how much current you have to provide in order to disinfect will determine the, uh, how much your energy budget is being used up by the electrochemical cell. So this is just some literature um, work that, that was done uh, in early 2000s by other groups that shows that the uh, E. coli here is uh, as, as is after chlorination, after ozonation, and here is after electrochemical oxidation. And they were trying to show that, in fact, you have a very um, aggressive environment when you do electrochemical oxidation. Now, the interesting thing here is that many of the reactions are similar, we think, right? The, the, you're generating chlorine and ozone in the electrochemical cell. So it could be that the actual reactions are the same. But the interesting thing, twofold, one is you're having a very high local concentration because now you have electrodes and your, your liquid, your infected liquid is going past electrodes, so there's not much diffusion needed. It's not like having a large um, uh, vat or uh, reservoir of liquid that you have to o ozonate or chlorinate. It's right there in the sort of millimeter kind of stage or range. So the local concentrations could be very high, and in fact, we think they are from where we're measuring them now. And in addition, you have an electrochemical potential across the electrodes, so you could also be creating some damage from that voltage. So those two things make it better than a simple um, chemical reaction. We also have to worry about viruses, and now I'm way out of my league biologically. Um, but we have to worry about viruses, and we will be looking at how to find a proxy for these viruses. And actually, Mark, Mark will answer any questions after the talk <laughs> if you're still here, because he's really a, a much, much better expert in that area than I am. Um, but it's something that uh, the groups, uh, again, the groups that are working together on this are trying, are being uh, encouraged to develop protocols that everyone accepts are valid proxies for these viruses, because some of them are either very difficult to handle or very difficult to measure. And so in order to get the knowledge turns we need, we're going to have to develop some clever ways of, of uh, handling that, uh, that area. But really the reason I show it is because it's another aspect of the project that we can't ignore, and there are probably many more experts in your all's area of the, of the university than in ours that may be able to help us with that. So why are we using this uh, Diamondox uh, cell uh, from uh, a, a company that's utilizing diamond electrodes? It, it sounds like, it sounds kind of ridiculous, right? If I tell you we're going we're gonna to use diamond electrochemical electrodes to treat waste. Well, I've been growing diamond in the lab for 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. And that's about when we learned how to do it, I'd say, in the US, although Russia and Japan had a decade start, head start on us. It turns out you can grow diamond pretty easily in the laboratory, and, and keep, keep in mind, we're not saying fake diamond. We're not saying diamond that is not really diamond but has the same properties. We're saying diamond. It's real diamond, right? It is man-made, but it's really diamond material. So why aren't I rich, retired, sitting <laughs> on a desert island somewhere, enjoying the sun? Well, it turns out that to get a single crystal, which has the optical properties you'd like in a gemstone diamond, is virtually impossible in a cost-effective way. But getting a thin film as an electrode is fantastically easy. When we first started growing diamond, everybody, I mean, all of us were having a terrible time. We were, we were just uh, refining pla these large plasma chemical vapor deposition systems. It was a terribly difficult process. And then somebody said, well, wait a minute, you can grow it in a microwave oven. And somebody proved it. You grow it in a microwave oven. And somebody else said, actually, we can grow it with a welding torch. And they grew it with a welding torch. And then we said, hey, you can grow it with a light bulb. <laughs> Broke off the glass, stuck the filament into the environment. Something got, we had light, we had uh, diamond, even did it in a high school. So it turns out that once you understand scientifically what's happening in the gas phase, you can grow diamond all different kinds of ways. Still, it's going to be very expensive to get that single crystal quality. But the polycrystalline thin film, no problem, and relatively inexpensive. You have it. You you have benefited from diamond thin films already, whether you know it or not. Not as much as you might benefit from a diamond single crystal jewelry, but you've benefited because uh, they're used for cutting tools, which are used to manufacture virtually every you know piece of equipment that that we work on that's got any complexity to it. So, so that's 
That's the diamond story. But why electrochemistry? Well, it turns out, as you know, diamond's very stable. Now, I probably shouldn't get started on it, but diamond's actually not the stable form of carbon in the atmosphere. It's the unstable form of carbon. Graphite is a stable form of carbon. But it just turns out that it takes millennia for it to change to graphite. So you're probably <coughs> okay. So diamond's very stable material, uh, what, what we say kinetically, not thermodynamically, but kinetically. So it's a great material for an electrode. And it turns out it has another particularly electrochemical property that is kind of unusual, and that it has what we call a large water window. And that means you can apply <coughs> large voltages across it relatively that before it starts to break down water. Whereas many materials, you put a voltage on them in, in an aqueous solution, including in urine, and they'll start to break down the water in that, in that urine immediately. And that could be problematic because you don't generate the chemicals, the, the most aggressive chemicals that you need in order to disinfect your urine. And that's just shown down here in this current versus voltage plot. So I set a large voltage window. Now, remember, I'm talking about sort of three volts, two and a half volts. But for most materials, it's less than two. So that's a big open area where we can now put a voltage and actually have reactions occurring on the diamond surface without hurting the diamond and without decomposing the water. Okay, so let's then look at some of the reactants. So these are the oxi oxidants that are useful in this um, environment, but we don't know which ones are the most useful. Maybe it doesn't even matter, but here's kind of the potentials where they're generated, and here is the, the list. So all of them are being generated in the electrochemical cell to help disinfect and kill the pathogens that we've already talked about. Um, the one problem is that we have a lower power efficiency as we go up to higher and higher voltages. So just like any system, if we operate this sort of really slowly and we don't put a lot of voltage on it, we might kill the pathogens eventually and be really energy efficient at it, ultimately, but that's not going to be sufficient. We have to kill them in a particular amount of time, right? That means we have to use what's called an overpotential, and that means we're not very efficient. And it turns out that the higher the overpotential, the less efficient you are. All that means for us is that our solar panel has to handle it. If our solar panel can handle it, or our combustion energy can handle it, then we should be okay, but we have to have a uh, margin of safety there as well. So this just shows the initial test. We actually use an organic dye to show at four volts how we change the color. At 12 volts, we get to clear very quickly. And this is the, we, we do all these studies to look at how quickly we get down to a low concentration of the organic. So right now, the organic is our proxy for some organic pathogen. Um, and obviously, the exact times won't be the same, but the, the process is similar, where you're, you're oxidizing the species, and that's similar um, to what you'll be doing with the pathogens. So um, here we see, see that at 4 volts, we don't ever get down to the low concentrations of the organic, and when we go to the very high voltages, the 12 volts, we get down very, very rapidly, but we're probably wasting a lot of energy in that case. Here's the curves that we need to generate with the E. coli and the viruses, et cetera, that really tell us how we design our system. And these are different concentrations. Let's concentrate on the lowest concentration. So we look at the World Health Organization standards for how much or how little E. coli you have to have in a sample of gray water, depending on its use. In this case, probably agricultural is where, where we'll start. You go to that concentration and you look at how quickly that concentration can be obtained in terms of its energy budget versus the voltage, and we find a minimum. And we're looking for that minimum in energy to get to the particular concentrations that's required by the WHO. So in this case, we're just looking at the organics I showed before, and we've looked at three different concentrations just for, for uh, uh, completeness. And at the lowest concentration, of course, it, caught, it requires the highest energy overall. It's the top curve, so the highest energy. And we see the minimum energy is shifted a little bit lower voltage, which is good for us. And we see it's for, sort of in that six or seven volt range. Gives us a range of where we have to apply, what we have to apply to the electrochemical cell for it to kill or for it to uh, eliminate this, ox, this uh, organic. We'll do the same thing with all kinds of system parameters. I'm not going to go through this, but it's just an example of electrode spacing, one more system parameter that we have to study to understand the energy budget that it requires and find the optimum or the, the lowest energy. So let's talk about energy balance for a minute. Uh, the energy balance here is, uh, really means 
how do we use the energy? And that doesn't mean just continuous energy, how much it takes as you run the system. But it also means what's the impulse requirement of the system. So you can imagine startup of the flame, or you can imagine starting up the electrochemical cell. Uh, we have a high load time of the day so that the combustion unit is full. That has to be have, have some sort of an impulse, and then as it burns, it takes a little less load on the energy. So we have these impulse requirements, and we have which is really called power, by the way. I mean, we say power in that case. And we have the continuous energy requirements. We also have to consider the intermittent nature of the source. So solar is not going to be around all the time, right? Depending on the region, it might not be around even for days. Um, the thermoelectric device, which we utilize for uh, capturing the combustion energy, the heat energy, also not on all the time. So again, we have to worry about the, this impulse nature of the uh, source of our energy. And we have to worry about efficiency, given that we're trying to generate this as a standalone unit. So here's the, the basic system, the diagram. The energy sources are the thermoelectric device, the solar panel, and the combustion. The energy sinks or uses are the screw conveyor, the electrochemical disinfection, and the ignition of the flame is a big one, so I put that one up there. So here's what we do for each component there. Obviously, I won't go through this, but since I'm from the engineering school, I had to put up some equations, or you all wouldn't think I was really from the engineering school. Um, so this just shows what we do for each module or each component, that we have to calculate the power required under instantaneous load and the continuous operation, and then balance that with the input powers and, uh, and load. So what this tells us, what we found when we did this, and the, the engineering management students were tremendous help in this area, but what it said to us is, how do we eliminate this screw conveyor? The screw conveyor takes so much power and energy that we need to look for ways to eliminate it. So we started doing that already. Obvious one might be gravity feed. Uh, one of the things I didn't, I didn't uh, note here is that this inclination, this age, so are you having to drive it up an incline as you compress the feces, or are you pushing it down an incline? That actually can be, posit it can be positive or negative. Right? If you're pushing it down, it gives you uh, uh, some help from gravity. Well, so when we thought about this, should we eliminate? We said, well, wait a minute. If we're getting help from gravity, why can't we just have a gravity feed? No screw conveyor at all. So that, those are the tests that are going, that are just being started now to see can we, with feces as delivered, provide some sort of a mechanism where they're conditioned, but they aren't actually compressed. Because that compression is the hardest and most energy intensive part. So the, the screw conveyor we're trying to eliminate because it took up a lot of the energy if you have a motor. And then the electrochemical cell, also a lot of energy. But it turns out a very small solar cell on the top of the roof will handle this electrochemical cell alone. We could still get the solar cell on the roof even if we had the motor for the screw conveyor, but we'd be getting closer to the limits. So the system now is just a solar cell uh, to a battery since we have intermittent energy. And uh, then the battery then discharges into the uh, electrochemical cell in the current designs. One thing we're really interested and excited about in this kind of a seedling project spinoff of this is if we know we need solar cells, they're probably the most vulnerable uh, module or component on this, on this uh, system, meaning that if somebody wants to steal something from this system, which is very common in these areas, the solar cells what to go after first. It's very easy to understand how to use it. It's not a difficult uh, material to work with once it's you know, fabricated. So there is a work now that the RTI has started on how do we make very, very cheap polymer solar cells on site. So you actually would provide the community with a, a what I would call a mini manufacturing facility. It, you know, now solar cells are done in the multi-billion dollar manufacturing facilities. This would be, you know, you think about it more like mixing paint than building silicon devices. And so the, that's captured the imagination of um, some of the folks at Gates and, and RTI working with some other uh, researchers and we're uh, in the process of uh, vetting that to see if it looks like a reasonable approach to make these very cheap solar cells. They would require more of them because they're not as good. But it still would be a real advantage. It wouldn't even even if they are stolen, it wouldn't be as big of a problem. But it would be less likely they're stolen if, in fact, in the community they're uh, being manufactured. Okay, so the solar energy requirements: um, battery capacity has to be greater than one day. The battery can be charged in less than one day. Number of users: five to twenty people. And we talked about the motor already. I'm missing part of the slide here, but. Give it a second. 
Um, what it turns out, if you use a car battery, you can get about a 13-day runtime, which gives you a lot of leeway in terms of the uh, solar flux, and you can um, not have a, a big issue in terms of storage capacity to handle the intermittent nature of the solar. Um, yeah, there we go. Of the solar um, flux. So again, a 50-watt solar panel and a 12-volt battery uh, looks like a, a good combination here. Less than 25% of the rooftop. Um, all right, let me try to wrap this up fairly quickly. Uh, the socioeconomic issues are just phenomenally interesting and complex, but so far outside of my area that we're utilizing some economists at RTI to guide a team of Duke students who have both the technical and the business interest and experience. Uh, so in this engineering management program. So these, this team of interns worked all last semester and worked on both the market and the social adoption. So I'll just run through a couple overheads on sort of what they, what they summarized. And that's an ongoing effort, of course, but uh, there's some interesting things that came out. So they looked at financial and supply chain issues, economic issues, political and public policy issues, and then social adoption or cultural issues. Um, the first thing was what, have, what has happened in the past, all the failures that have already occurred in developing countries, developing regions, and there have been plenty of them with lots of great technology and or great intention, but lots of failures. So we looked at technical failures, financial failures, and societal failures. They looked at the failures, they weren't categorized this way, so they had to try and figure out, well, how can we learn from them in this project, and came up with that categorization. The technological failures first. I won't try to go through any of these. I just want to show the highlighted ones in red because they're really interesting to me and, and kind of representative. So inconvenient to use. So inconvenient to collect ashes from the stove. I talked about this already, but think about as scientists, how often do we have to worry about the simple act of somebody cleaning out a stove? Well, now all our designs have to take that into account because if it's problematic, if it frustrates the user, if it frustrates the maintenance person who is uh, required to take the ash out, they're not going to do it. And very soon, you will have feces mixed with already burned ashes, and your stove will not work. Your module will, will fail. So, and there's a bunch of other things they found. And same thing on the financial failures. One was this capital cost to build the on-site facility. Talked a little bit about the solar cell. We're trying to expand that model into even the modules so that the whole module can be done <coughs> at least close by, if not on-site. And then the societal failures, the, the two really I talked about the theft, so I won't, I won't belabor that. The other one I thought was very interesting is that users want a flush toilet. If the developing world has a flush toilet, and that's the gold standard, why shouldn't the developing worlds have a flush toilet? Very logical approach, right? Impossible in many respects, given the infrastructure. So there's now the whole discussion about, well, how do you change or educate? How do we provide the evidence that, that the developed countries are going to take over the technology that we develop for the developing countries. That's the Gates program goal, is you develop it for the developing world, but it's so good environmentally and so effective economically that ultimately developing countries take this, this technology over as well. So how do we convince the users that that is actually the case, that they're getting a leapfrog in, in terms of better technology than a flush toilet with this program. And then we also have to make sure it's sustainable, and that means sustainable for businesses that maintain and uh, collect the ash, collect the, the gray water, and use it in different places. And to do that, we have to know the number of users, how effective uh, the uh, cost, how cost effective the unit is to operate, etc. So I won't go into it, but they did a lot of work on that. And one thing that's I think I might have glossed over a little bit, but I think is critical here is the goal is not a big, huge uh, facility to treat human waste, right? The goal is ultimately a family-based unit. A family-based unit has the dignity and the um, ease of use that we want for the developing worlds, as opposed to a public facility, but it's going to take a long time to get there. So there's now sort of an intermediate step that probably this unit that we're working on will go to, which is sort of the 20 to 30 people. But ultimately, we want it down to the single family unit, but still has to be cost effective and easy to install and maintain. So that's the direction we're going. And that is the market analysis then is highly impacted by that assumption. And uh, the so what for all these, these studies that I talked about, the socioeconomic studies, 
is you have to leverage nonprofits and NGOs for that initial capital cost that is likely to be required. Uh, the maintenance has to address the commercial disposal of all the waste, not just user driven. Um, in other words, that the operation has to support a business that will come in and take care of the ash and the gray water. Um, you have to access, you know, or determine if users are willing to pay for this. Is it is it important enough that they'll put in some money? And users in this case means both the individuals but also the local communities. Because if you can't if you can't uh, drive that or if you can't convince yourself that's the case, this becomes a very very difficult problem. Odor control we talked about and that needs to be considered. Buy-in from a lot of government players in these regions is required. I talked about the per household use rather than communal use. There's a very slow adoption cycle here, so the goal would be to start with settlements that have housing. It sounds kind of funny, when to start with settlements that have housing, but many of these settlements don't truly have housing, right? Um, I'm sure you all have seen more of them than I have um, in your work line of work, but many of them are, are simply uh, rooftops of communal areas as opposed to a true house. And then the hygiene education has to be an ongoing effort. There's no question that that's going to be something that we continue for many, many years. And with that, I will stop. Uh, that's really everything I want to talk about. This is just a very brief summary of the different topics and happy to answer questions or have a discussion or whatever you like.